Last week in my lecture, I talked about the flaneur, the city walker, or more broadly, the walker over familiar terrain, who walks over familiar terrain with no real purpose other than to experience the terrain with as much immediacy as is possible. In other words, don't walk for instrumental reasons. Get rid of your telos. Get rid of your purpose and simply see what is there to be seen. And I talked about how this, this dynamic, the flaneur dynamic, is really one of making the familiar unfamiliar. And that is one option for you uh, in writing travel memoir. You don't have to go anywhere exotic. You don't have to go anywhere far away. You can simply treat what is close to you as if it is suddenly not close to you. You can make the near seem far, the ordinary seem exotic. This week, I want to talk about the opposite movement, uh, a, a travel memoir that makes the unfamiliar familiar. Now, this particular kind of travel memoir usually does require that you find yourself in a strange place, a place you've never been before, a, a different country, a different city, um, and, and you are there and you're raw and you're naive and you're a greenhorn. You don't really know what is what. So what are some um, structural options for you if you decide to explore the turn, the unfamiliar into the familiar mode? That was a mouthful, wasn't it? Well, you might consider the, the, the structure of finding the limitations in your own biases. You, you may approach a city, a whole country with certain prejudices you may imagine that um, French people, for instance, are standoffish, um, that they don't like Americans. And in the course of your travel, you might find, well, that's not really true. Um, if you attempt to speak the language and are not afraid to look goofy while trying to speak the language, if you don't put on any sort of um, air of American superiority, um, it's quite likely that you will find that your stereotypes concerning um, the French are inaccurate. So you could explore what, what I would call, I guess, a, a, a moral direction where you, in the course of encountering something other, realize that you've been living with biases, stereotypes, prejudices that have encouraged you to treat others unfairly. So I'll call that the moral mode, um, the undercutting of prejudice uh, in, in the face of um, otherness that shows you that your prejudices were wrongheaded. What's another um, dynamic? Let's say <clears throat> you, in the course of your travels to a new city, a new country, you discover something new um, about yourself you find a new way to see, a new way to speak, a new way to think. And this serves almost like an epiphany. Um, you are broken open. You are awakened. And you feel as if you have a new sight. I remember uh, traveling in Istanbul um, some years ago and going to the famous Blue Mosque. Um, after having been in a lot of the European Catholic cathedrals like St. Paul's, um, like St. Peter's, like... Um, any, any number of, of, of the famous cathedrals um, in Europe, um, Notre Dame, before it, before it burned. And then suddenly going to the Blue Mosque, and there's nothing in there really by comparison. It's just beautiful carpets on the floor and, and vast reaches of space. Whereas, of course, in a lot of the medieval and even Renaissance um, Christian cathedrals, there's a feeling of, of crowdedness. With all the icons and all the or, all the or, ornate sculptures and all the tombs, but here there's nothing. So I suddenly started thinking about spaces in a different way. When I would see something, I would also see what was not that something. So it's almost like a whole new sight opened up for me. Again, start thinking about how how emptiness is not empty, how nothing is not really nothing, that nothing is something. Not a major insight, really, uh, but that's what happened. That's what happened on that trip. So the, the opening of a new site in the new landscape, the new cityscape, um, I might call this the mode of the epiphany.
the epiphonic mode. So if the moral mode is the undercutting of prejudice, the epiphonic mode would be the opening up of a new site. Well, there's a, a, a third um, dynamic I wish to describe, uh, and that would be no matter where you go, you stay the same. <laughs> <laughs> that you go uh, to this exotic country, um, and when you get there, uh, you hope for an, an undercutting of your prejudice. You hope for the opening of a new site, but what you really get is nothing. Um, in other words, you find that you cannot really adapt and change and open like you thought you would. Um, and so instead of, of walking out into the city at night, you find yourself in your room uh, watching Netflix on your iPad, which is the same thing you would do at home. Uh, this this uh, particular dynamic, I think, um, could be a comic mode. Uh, because, I mean, what is comedy really? But on one level, it's the undercutting of expectations. So if you know, if I expect the most basic comic pratfall is slipping on a banana peel. If I'm walking down the street expecting to walk successfully down the street, and all of a sudden I slip on a banana peel, bam! Um, I go down, well, that's funny. Um, because ultimately it says that, it suggests that no matter how serious and important we think we are or want to be, we're really nothing but bodies pushed around by gravity. This is, of course, the, the genius of great slapstick comedy um, with Buster Keaton and, and Charlie Chaplin. Um, so I think, I think that, 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 that the idea of, 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 well, really, no matter where you go, there you are, could make for all sorts of, of, of comic scenes, comic possibilities. And we see a little bit of this in the David Foster Wallace piece, uh, supposedly fun thing I'll never do, or Shipping Out was an alternative title, where he's constantly sort of, of course he's really in some ways he's, he's working in all three of these modes I'm describing. Uh, he, he is very keen on a kind of moral aspect of tourism. Um, and often it comes across in his satirizing the, the prejudices of his fellow shipmates, but he turns that, that criticism on himself quite frequently. But also, he's, he is someone very much open to, open to new experiences, uh, epiphanies, um, new insights, and he gains these on, on his trip as well. But ultimately, he is a writer of comedy, and uh, a lot of comedy emerges in that piece from his desire to achieve something that he should as a tourist, but he's unable to. Uh, because he has these certain ingrained habits that don't allow him to. So those are just three um, options for you. Of course, there are many, many more. Um, and, and of course, any of these three options could be treated comically, if you wish. Um, it just seems that the last one it invites comedy um, more so. But the, the, a very important final thing I say, when, when you write a travel memoir, um, you have to be so careful not to use cliches. There are travel magazines everywhere. There are travel documentaries everywhere. There are travel books everywhere. Uh, we are inundated with cliches um, centered upon travel. It's difficult not to use them, but you really want your language to be, to be uh, attuned to your particularity, attuned to what happened to you and no one else. And if you can find the, the imagery to capture those experiences that happen to you and no one else, you'll be okay. You won't fall into cliche. But just know it's, it, it's especially a danger in writing travel memoir um, to fall into cliche. All right, that's it. I look forward to reading your um, short pieces this week.